I've played a lot of Catan, I work for Colonist, but I don't have any impressive achievements in this game. So in this video, I will try to become one of the top 10 players on Colonist within one week. And if I fail, next season I'll close myself in a room until I succeed and I'll live stream the whole process. I'm okay at Catan, but I'm definitely not world class. So I'm going to have to be a little sneaky. Every three months, the colonist season resets. And that's exactly what I'm going to take advantage of. After the reset, everyone has to play 10 placement games. Depending on how you do, you'll be roughly one to two divisions lower than your previous season. So I'm going to try and play as much as possible the first few days of the season to try to sneak my way into the top of the leaderboards. Now, so I don't exploit this too much, one of the rules is that before the challenge ends, I have to reach colonist highest division, which is diamond. Basically, if I become diamond and I'm top 10 in the world, I win. If not, you'll see me locked in a room next season. The season started at around 3 a.m. my time, so I woke up at 6 and got straight to the grind. I started off strong, barely losing my first game with 9 points. But I came back and won my second game, putting me at an early 50% win rate. Wow, I've been waiting for that fight forever. Let's go! Let's go! Spoilers, this wouldn't last for long. The third game, I again came second with my opponent drawing a victory point to win. But I managed to secure my 50% win rate in my fourth game, sneakily taking both the army and the road to win. I think the proper way to summarize games five and six is I got cooked. No need to get into details there. My seventh placement game, I was stubborn about getting army, so I kept drawing development cards to get that, but the colonist gods had a different plan for me. So I ended up again winning sneakily with three victory points this time. I really wanted to win game number eight to get my 50% win rate back. And with a crazy dev card game where we basically draw the deck, I managed to come back again with three victory points and the army. But of course, my beloved win percentage wouldn't last long as in game nine, it was me who was defeated by a sneaky road stealer. And game number 10, well, I'd rather not talk about it. With the 10 placement games done, it was time to get a sense of how hard the challenge would be. I genuinely had no idea where I would be placed. I could either be completely terrible or quite decent given I finished Diamond last season. So with four out of 10 wins, I was ranked. Okay, okay, number 39, not bad, not bad. Number 39 in the world. And this is where I actually thought to myself, okay, this challenge isn't going to be that hard after all. Yeah, um, no comments. For the next few days, Collins was going to become my life. I played all day, everywhere. And honestly, the momentum didn't seem to stop at first. Winning game 12 by Monopoly in Wheat put me at number 19 in the world and still with a 42% win rate. However, the bubble seemed to pop for the first time as I entered my longest losing streak so far. <laughs> That's four in a row. Four brutal games without even coming close to winning. But this luckily proved to be nothing more than a small setback. But winning game 17 with a sneaky Rodan army play and game 18 with a strong or weak sheet setup put me at number eight in the world. This was huge. For the first time in the challenge, I met one of the two requirements, being top 10 in the world. All I had to do now was reach diamond without moving down more than two spots in the leaderboard that would be it. But despite having what I thought was a rock solid setup, in the next game, I was defeated by the player who would become my enemy, Fluffy Kitty. Up until this point, I felt like given that the season had just reset, I wasn't being ranked with the strongest players. Me and my opponents all made small mistakes throughout the games, but Fluffy Kitty didn't. His game was rock solid and basically flawless. So it was a reality check. And it was at this point that I started going back through my games using replay and analyzing what I could have done better. But I quickly realized I don't know what I don't know. So I reached out to Colonist Celebrity, former number one ranked Catan player in the world, and at the time of making this video, number one ranked player on Colonist, Dandy Drew. And in an absolute plot twist fashion, Dandy Drew revealed to me that he was in fact Fluffy Kitty. I kid you not, this is exactly how it happened. So I had to swallow my pride and learn from the guy who had just kicked my ass. And these are some of the teachings I took away. What do you think were like my biggest mistakes? You know, I've been thinking a lot about the idea of pacing recently. So pacing is how do you keep up with the board so that you can keep trades flowing, um, but also to kind of keep a, a sense of balance with everyone else. 
I think for a lot of new players, they focus on pacing points, right? So five is greater than four, therefore that person's in the lead. There's another level to this, right? Which is you can pace on a win condition. So you can pace going for army or, or going for longest road. And then the one that probably doesn't get talked enough about is pacing on production. So, I mean, you could have five points while everyone has three, but if other players are dropping cities, in the end game, you're going to actually lose momentum on their production. Looking back at that game, that's kind of where you probably misstepped a bit, where you did pace the win condition, you did pace points, but you didn't pace on production because you didn't build an early city on your, your setup. But I, ultimately, I think production wins games. And if you don't keep up on that front, you're probably going to struggle as the game progresses. And I think that's where you went wrong. How do you balance having an early city with being targeted? So when to go for the city, when to go for development cards? As a general rule, I've always kind of felt if you don't know what to do, build a city because it's almost always useful. To me, that early city is such a big play for the development card player that it actually kind of shocks me that players don't do it more often. They usually invest into a lot of early development cards, which is good, you get army, but what happens is once you take army, you get blocked to death and you get robbed to the point where you fall behind as the game progresses. And I think that's ultimately like the situation you fell into. With the learnings I took from Dandy Drew's masterclass, I was ready to bring this challenge home. Day four was actually sweet. With Drew's teachings, I had a better sense of a game plan and I focused on getting more cities early on. Specifically, my 28th game covers most of the themes we talked about. I saved up and traded for an early city. This multiplied my production early on and allowed me to place a settlement on the last resource I needed, sheep. And it was only at that point that I started drawing development cards to get army. This pacing worked great because by the time my opponents were targeting me with the robber, I was drawing development cards to move it back. The game ended with a big last turn. After a Monopoly, I had 20 cards and I was able to build two roads, a settlement, and a city. This improved pacing, thanks to Dandy Drew, led to me winning four out of my nine games that day, becoming number nine in the world, having a solid 39% win rate, and being only one win away from becoming Diamond. I was so close, so close, but I had to go to sleep. I thought to myself, I'll just win one in the morning, and I'll be done with this. I had no idea what was about to come. I woke up being one win away from being top 10 in the world and becoming diamond. I was basically ready to wrap up, call it a day and record this video. However, the biggest, most frustrating series of events took place throughout the entire day. Game 29 was fine. I was at nine points for a second and then my road got ruthlessly stolen. But it was from game 30 where I finished with five miserable points that I started a trend. A trend of ridiculous misfortune and especially a lot of bad, impulsive decisions. Game 31, never even had a chance of being close to winning. 32, an even game for three of us where the winner beat us before we could basically even start playing. It was around this point where a vicious cycle started. Having the goal so close, I started to lose focus. I kept thinking, ah, I'm just gonna win any of these and then I'll be done but I was less concentrated and made worse decisions because I just wanted that quick win instead of playing for the smart percentage plays. Game 33, I finished dead last. The colonist gods were poking fun at me. Game 34, we all had like no points and the player who won kicked our asses. Sneaking army and road from nowhere, he beat us in like 20 minutes. Seriously, it was bad. Game 35, I was again destroyed and my early city wasn't able to help me this time around. I think you get the picture. I was getting obliterated and it didn't stop for games 36 through 40. And continuing to play and tunnel vision for six hours straight wasn't helping in the slightest. So I used all the willpower within me to stop gambling by playing more games and I quit for a few hours. I came back refreshed with a new mindset and tried to forget about the tragedy that had unfolded the rest of the day. And this is where the fun started. Game 41, I was paired with not one, but two of Dandy Drew's students who immediately invoked him in the chat. I, of course, played dumb and wondered, if I win right now, would that make me the superior student? Honestly, I think the side quests helped me forget about my burning passion to win and especially to finish the challenge. So the story of this game was rather different. One of the students had an ideal setup and the chat started to target him. Of course, I hopped on that boat immediately and I was able to sneak an early city on a strong or weak sheep spot. Coach would be so proud. With two cities, I was starting to get targeted. So I began to think I might have to go back to my roots and what was getting success at the beginning of this challenge, 
being sneaky. So I started the purchase of development cards to get army and instead got three victory points, the ultimate scenario for a sneaky win. All I had to do now was hope that no one took the road, connect my two settlements and boom, sneaky road win. And after a day of 12 defeats in a row and six hours of the purest form of suffering, I did exactly that. I placed my roads and stole the victory. That had to be it. The challenge was over. But when I went to check the leaderboards, I realized I was A, number 11 in the world and thus not top 10, and B, not even diamond yet. All those losses had made me seriously go down the ladder. But I was back and with Dandy Drew basically admitting that I was his favorite student, I had all the motivation I needed. I won my next game swimmingly and I was back on track. Or so I thought because I went on to lose three in a row again. But with these two wins, I was still one win away from completing the challenge once and for all, becoming top 10 for at least a few minutes and not having to lock myself in a room next season. And at this point, during the climax of the challenge, the colonist gods decided to put a beautiful opportunity in my way. My next game I was paired with, and I swear this wasn't scripted in the slightest, Fluffy Kitty. My enemy turned coach was now the final boss of the challenge, and I was determined. I had an okay setup producing all resources and I got an early settlement to make sure Dandy Drew couldn't sneak up on me. Then I had a big turn where I managed to get a city on my best spot as well as take the road. Of course, this meant that everyone was going to target me, especially with Fluffy Kitty's impeccable table talk. And honestly, for a while, I was only able to build one settlement and things got pretty close to my road getting stolen. But as I said, the colonist gods seemed to have a plan for me and I got all the resources I needed in the last orbit. After 45 minutes of pure tension, I managed to win the game to make the story come full circle. And with that, in an instance of true board game poetry, I defeated my coach. But not only that, this was the game that finally made me reach the highest division on Colonist, Diamond. Now all that was left was to check if I was finally in that glorious top 10. And after 45 games, well over 24 hours spent playing in just five days, and one of the most frustrating days of my life, I not only snuck into the top 10, but I was the number six ranked player on Colonist. Oh, vamos! Let's go, let's go. Of course, that probably only lasted for a few minutes, but at least I don't need to lock myself in a room. Unless you guys insist in the comments. Bye bye.